So I'm going to cover three topics in this presentation. And the first is why you should hope that there is good quality policy work being done. The second is why good quality policy work requires someone like you. And the third is how to do good quality policy work. So as I hope you've guessed, the title is not about me. The title is about the people in this room hopefully becoming enthusiastic policy people and being on the path to becoming the contact point for legislators. So for the first part, why you should hope that good quality policy work is getting done. Right now, there's a lot of countries that are already thinking about a new category of legislation. So after working on copyright and patents for two or three decades, uh, we now see a lot of countries are uh, talking about software liability, artificial intelligence and cybersecurity regulations. In particular, the European Union already has legislation written on all three of these. So historically, the US was often the focus of legislative issues and this was because we focused a lot on copyrights and patents and these were always very well developed and often litigated in the US. Uh, for these new categories of legislation there is more happening in the EU and the reason is because the US is usually quite slow to regulate new areas. It lets things develop and then steps in when things might be going wrong whereas the European Union when it sees something new developing, likes to create a legal framework for the thing to develop in. And so we have all this legislation now in the European Union, and so this is hopefully something that other parts of the world can learn about. So the topic of liability is quite a difficult one because this means that you will be liable, you can be sued for damages if your software causes harm. and. This is something that some people think is fixed by our licenses, which all say that this software comes with no warranty and we are not liable for any damage caused. Uh, however, it's important to remember that the law trumps licenses, and so if the law says you're liable, then you are liable. The second category then is the, the EU Cyber Resilience Act and the AI Act, and these are market regulations. So we never had market regulation before for software. The idea here is that if you want to put software on the market, if you want to make it available to other people, then you have to comply with the Cyber Resilience Act and the AI Act first. So until now, there was a presumption that software was treated like literature, and so there was a general freedom to publish, and these market regulations change that situation into a you can publish if. So the status of the EU regulations is that the text has been written and adopted, and so that's not going to change. However, the obligations won't actually apply in most cases until 2027. So between now and then, we've got three years to work on guidelines and standards and procedures. And some of these are required by the legislation, and so we're working with the European Commission on them. And then some of them are guidelines and procedures that we are writing ourselves to help make compliance easier. So these are the three main reasons why it's important for everyone that there is good legislation. If there is a market regulation or liability that causes developers to be nervous about sending patches, so for example you might have companies where they use a lot of free software and they might extend the software or uh, make some, some small fixes. Today, they usually send those patches upstream simply because it's easier to uh, have the maintenance being done upstream together with the main project. Uh, however, if people have to start clearing this with their supervisors or legal departments, uh, then people may decide that it's not worth the effort to send patches upstream. So this is one way it could create friction in our development model. And then on the other end, if projects have to take responsibility for all the patches they receive in a, a legal sense, if they have a liability, then they may be more cautious about what patches they accept. 
Which means, in general, the the natural, the organic way that uh, free and open source pro projects grow uh, would be harmed at least, and so this would make it more difficult for people to grow their own projects. Uh, but it also means that if there are few people, fewer people contributing to a project, then that's going to affect the quality of the software as well. So the second problem is that if people are worried about all these regulations which are about distributing software, then they may see online services as an alternative. And the risk here is that our software ends up being replaced by thin clients which will access online services. So here it's important to remember uh, Obviously, the reason why we, uh, we we like free and open source software is because we have the, the freedom to use, study, modify, and redistribute. And with proprietary software, you don't get these, uh, or you don't get them all, at least. However, with pri proprietary software, at, l at the least, you do get usually to keep a copy. And you can often do some kind of forensics and, on how it works. And you can usually check whether the software has changed or not. With an online service, you lose these abilities because the, the copy can disappear at any time. Uh, there's no way to uh, watch how it's executing, and there's also no way to see if it has changed. So while proprietary software is bad, uh, it's still better than online services. Of course, what we really want is to have then free or open source software. But the so, so, so in this sense, we, we could end up in a weaker situation if we begin to rely on, on online services. The third issue is that bad legislation just makes life difficult for everyone. And so we can see now in the European Union, uh, there are more than six obligations, but just uh, if we imagine that the European Union has created six obligations for people distributing software, if country number two comes along and copies three and adds three of their own, then all of a sudden we've got nine, nine obligations now if somebody wants to distribute software in both countries. And then you have another country and another, and eventually you end up with, in this example, 29 obligations. Now, for some projects, they will decide that they only want to distribute in a certain number of countries. And so they may uh, do the paperwork and the compliance uh, to be able to distribute in some of the countries, uh, just to avoid having too many obligations. And other projects may decide that they want to focus on different countries. So you may have software that can be distributed in Europe and Japan, but not Korea and not uh, Canada, for example. Uh, then you know, what if these projects what if one of them is a web server and the other is a programming language and you want to distribute them together? Well, then you can only distribute in the countries for which you have the documentation and the compliance uh, for both, both projects. So with this situation, with this fragmenting of regulation, uh, you risk having an ever-increasing number of obligations and an ever-shrinking number of countries in which you can actually distribute your software. So. The, the th those obligations are, are one example. Another example could be SBOM formats and the contents. So you could have different uh, countries requiring uh, one one or the other of the two main SBOM formats, but there also could be differences between uh, what must be in the SBOMs for those countries. So those are the reasons why I hope you'll agree that it would be good if we have better regulation instead of bad regulation. The next thing is why I'm giving this talk in to this audience. So first off, I, I should mention that I was a software developer 20 years ago. And so I, I've made the, the transition from being a software developer to being a policy person. And there are a lot of benefits. And this is something that is uh, it's, it's very necessary that we have people who uh, have both areas of knowledge. Uh, so we're trying to get the legislators to understand uh, how we develop software, how we distribute software, and also how it moves around. And so that's a strange way of describing it. But the reason is because, the, for example, in the Cyber Resilience Act, the obligations are triggered by placing the software on the market. And that is another way of saying making the software available to people. So. If we, if we look at how proprietary software is developed, the development happens with different teams within a company and they share the software, but none of this matters because the software is not available on the market. So there's no obligations. And then the company will make a decision to send the project and sell the product to customers and this will be linked to income. And so the, the obligations will be triggered once at a time chosen by the company. 
In contrast, with the free or open source project, we have everything being distributed over the internet. And instead of having a small number, we often have a, as large as number, a number as possible of teams and companies and individuals working. And some of them are going to be big and some are small. And the problem is that every time the software moves between these entities, there's the possibility that the obligations get triggered. And so you have the same legislation, but the way it works is that the compliance is repeated again and again in the case of free and open source or, well, online collaborative software. Uh, and also the obligations in this case are not linked to a commercial act. So the cost of doing compliance isn't happening at the same time as income uh, that would be able to cover that cost. So that's one way of looking at it. Uh, the other issue is the complexity that because we don't have a, a single company that is both the distributor and the employer of the developers, we end up in a situation where for a proprietary software company, they have one obligation when they sell the product, but for free and open source software companies, each company will be distributing or selling the product and each one will have to do a compliance procedure. So you have a multiplication of the compliance procedures, but also company A will have to be responsible for the software of companies B, C and D and B to the other companies. And so the, the complexity increases a lot and the number of compliance procedures increases. So on paper, it's the same set of regulations for everyone, but in practice, it can be a lot more complicated for people who are developing out in the open. So this is the obligations of in proprietary software and for free and open source software it could be much more complicated. So this is something we need the legislators to understand, that the legislation affects free and open source software differently. So that's one of the tasks is explaining our methods to the legislators. Uh, another task is that we also need to investigate the needs of our developers. So when people are deciding what policy recommendations to make to the legislators, we need to make sure that, that our policy people, people like me, are well informed about what are, is actually needed by the, uh, the developers and the projects and the companies in the, the ecosystem. So for an example of this, I, I'd like to raise the AI uh, question of how to apply the free software or the open source definition. And so uh, Free Software Foundation published uh, a, a news article about this uh, last week and Open Source Initiative will be publishing their uh, version 1.0 of their open source AI definition uh, tomorrow, I believe. So the, the complication here is that <clears throat> for an AI model, there is no source code. We, we usually look for source code. The, the More precisely, we look for the preferred form for making modifications. And so for software, we ask for source code, and that's fairly sim simple. But for AI, we could ask for the training data. This is uh, what some people would see as the source code. Uh, however, the training data is is not a human written thing that could also also be human understandable. Uh, it also comes along with uh, legal and practical and even existential problems. So the legal problems with asking for trading data include uh, the copyright questions of who are the owners of those seven million web pages that you scraped. Uh, there can be privacy issues with, uh, in Europe, we have the GDPR uh, privacy laws, uh, but in general, a lot of company, countries will have laws that will limit the amount of medical data, for example, that you can distribute, or any personal and identifiable da data. And so with these limitations, uh, it's often legally not possible to, uh, to, to make the, the data available. And the, the final uh, problem with asking for training data uh, is that sometimes the tra training data doesn't exist anymore. And that, is, uh, that can happen, for example, if you are training an AI based on a video camera uh, that is watching a public space or even uh, watching a, a television. Uh, when the training data has been converted into the model, the training data no longer exists anywhere. And so it's possible to train a model and not keep a copy of all the data you were using during training. And in some cases, for copyright reasons, you wouldn't even be allowed to take a copy of the training data. So 
sometimes the training data is legally not distributable. Uh, sometimes it doesn't exist. But then there's also a question of, do we even want the training data? And so this is uh, a practical issue related to how much computing power it takes to convert training data into a model. So the, uh, for, for large, uh, large language models, and in particular uh, image and video generators, the amount of data is, is already massive and it's all, uh, still growing. And the amount of computing power is usually, uh, well, it, it's measured in the millions or hundreds of millions of dollars worth of, of computing power to train uh, top of the range uh, LLMs and uh, image and video generators. So in this sense, if we had access to the training data, but we didn't own the data centers necessary and have the, the computing power necessary, then it wouldn't actually be something that's useful. So this is the, the, the state of the, uh, the problem. The current solutions are to possibly focus instead on retraining the AI model instead of being, focusing on being able to rebuild the training model, uh, sorry, the, the AI model from training data, being able to do incremental training on the AI model. Uh, now, this is uh, still not not clear to me if this is sufficient to be able to say that we really have enough uh, abilities to study and modify the, the AI model. Uh, but it's, it's an example of the type of question that we need to work with the software developers, the projects, and the companies who are commercializing. So... At the moment, uh, FSF and OSI have both published their paper, their positions. Uh, they're, they use very different words, and I'm a little bit worried that there's going to be people who interpret these two positions as being in conflict, but actually they're they're very similar. Uh, the, the They both say that you have to be uh, free to study and modify the model, and they both say that AI can be approved with or without training data. And they, then they say that if the training data isn't published, there will be extra conditions. But they're not very clear on what exactly the extra conditions are. So uh, in the OSI document, the extra conditions are quite quite minimal. And I think maybe it, they, they will eventually be tightened up over time. And in what FSF has published, they've only given very narrow examples uh, of, of what would be allowed. And so I, I presume that will be relaxed over time. And so I think the two will converge on a uh, consensus. But the, it all comes down to what information do AI developers need about a model in order to be able to study and modify. Like a, a model can often be a spreadsheet of a billion numbers. And so if you give the spreadsheet to somebody and say they can study and modify, then that's, you know, that's very nice, but it's not actually practical. So you have to give them some kind of information about the, the numbers uh, so that they'll be able to really uh, study and then modify. So this is the open question for uh, for people in the room, for people watching the video at home. Uh, we're going to have to w work on this after the version 1.0 of OSI's open source AI definition is published tomorrow. And uh, we'll also review whatever FSF publishes in the coming uh, months. So, having hopefully explained why it is necessary that we get people who have technical knowledge to come over and do policy work, uh, the next question then is how do you do policy work in a useful way? So I'll break this down into uh, making your case, organizing the work, and some strategy ideas. So one of the important things is to simplify. And the reason I'd say this is because whenever people present a very complex diagram to a policymaker, the policymaker will not take the time to pick out pick this diagram apart and try and understand it. And so I, I think usually when you display something complex to a policymaker, it's because you don't want them to understand it. Uh, you would rather that they listen to the positions of company A versus company B and choose between these two. In the case of AI legislation, 
this doesn't work in our favor. And so I think it's all important always to try and simplify the the concept of AI and try and avoid the idea that it's something that people can't understand. For example, there is a company that is using the term open source AI uh, for an AI system that is absolutely not open source. And whenever they discuss this with policymakers, they have a diagram with 25 bo boxes and where they show uh, what an AI system is. And I can understand for a policymaker if they see these diagram of 25 boxes, it looks like something complex that they couldn't understand. However, I, I would disagree. I, I would say that actually an AI system is the same as a software system with just an AI model added. And so the, the policies we already have in place for software are enough to cover the other parts. And all we really need to do is decide what do we do about the AI models. The second thing is that I've developed this overview of what an AI system is or how, how it comes into being. And so the, uh, the goal here is to explain that training data is often a, a very large mountain of data. It gets pushed through a very small piece of software and the training software is generally free and open source software. Most of these, uh, most of the training software is released under uh, the Apache license. But the training software is not enough on its own. You then you get the model, and then everything after the model could be just summarized as being part of the app. So in this example, uh, using the definition I, I discussed earlier, to be able to say that you're creating a, a free software or open source AI system, uh, we would say that the model has to be has to come with the four freedoms and the training software. Plus, you must provide some information about the training data. Now, we don't. I don't think we have a good definition for exactly what information yet, but the goal would be enough information about the training data so that somebody could look at the model and understand what's going on and would, they, would thus be able to modify to extend it or to suit their needs. So that's the, the first thing is to focus on, on simplifying uh, so that people can uh, decide that they understand it and can uh, take a position. The second thing is it's important to categorize all the different issues raised by a certain topic. And so I'm not going to go through the entire list, but for AI, we have an internal definition. Uh, we have projects and procedures th that are needed by companies, and that's for what they write, for contributions from third parties, for software they distribute that they didn't developer, develop, uh, for cooperating with develop developers they don't employ, uh, for users to check unwanted bias, and this is particularly important for government bodies. They often have legal obligations to, uh, to check for unwanted bias. Uh, then there are things like future leg legislative needs. Uh, it's difficult to predict the future, but I, I, I think it's likely that there will be a proposal uh, soon to bring in some kind of harmonization of copyright to address the uh, the situation of AI training data and models. Uh, so in, in general, the situation there is that it's not clear yet whether somebody owning copyright over part of the training data, should they also then own some of the copyright of the model that is generated from that training data. Uh, it, it could be argued that the the model should only include the concepts and the style of the training data. It shouldn't include the, directly the uh, the expression of um, the expression of thought that is in the, the training data. And so, it, it should be possible that the AI model does not contain any copyrightable fragments of the training data. However, this is something that is difficult to to be certain of, and there are frequently legal challenges uh, from image and music generators from people who say that their images or their music was obviously included in the training data because you can hear something that's very similar in the output of the, the AI model. Uh, so th this is something that we, we can't really sort out in courts because if a training mod if a model is trained on uh, 7,000 or 7 million web pages and or the same number of songs, and if it's going to be distributed in 100 countries, then we can't uh, 
litigate each one of those possible authors uh, in order to get clarity. Uh, and so it's it's quite likely there will be some kind of uh, copyright harmonization treaty or law proposed in the coming years. Uh, then there's also the, the question of people who do publish data. Uh, some laws, like the EU's AI Act, uh, allows them to opt out, but it's not very clear exactly how they can do this. The, there is a, a court case now to uh, check that, to uh, test that question. Uh, and then there are also competition law issues, but I'm not sure if this is relevant for free and open source software. But the the reason I broke everything down into this list of categories is that I've noticed quite often that discussions of AI policy and legislative issues, they sometimes they, they stop making progress after a few minutes. And I, I think the issue is that people are mixing together multiple issues uh, without realizing that, that there are different effects and different solutions for each of these issues and, and different groups of people are affected. Uh, so I think this sort of thing uh, can be useful. If it's not possible to simplify things down to four boxes, then uh, at least if we can categorize things and try and have a more structured conversation, then that can be another way that we can uh, improve the, the quality of conversations we have with policy makers. My third piece of uh, advice for how to make your case uh, is to always have a large number of arguments for whatever position you're going to be advising. Uh, Twelve, it doesn't really have to be the, the number, but the important thing here is that people often, and I, I know this because I was this way uh, when I started working on policy, I was convinced that monopolies were the cause of most of the problems with software uh, in uh, in the world and so I thought this was the argument and that if as soon as people understood uh, the existence of monopolies and the effects of monopolies then this would easily lead them to uh, reach the same conclusions I had reached. And uh, I then went and spoke to policymakers and found that some of them don't care at all about monopolies. Some of them think that uh, actually we need much bigger companies so that we can uh, compete on the global stage and uh, other some people think that monopolies uh, they might be a problem but you don't solve them in legislation you solve them in court cases so there are a lot of uh, people who will not share any of the 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 main justifications that you have and so it's it's very important to have a long list of arguments and then discuss these with as many people as possible so that you can get feedback and you can realize which ones are actually convincing and which are not. To do that, you have to make sure you're listening when you do this, discuss this with people. It's not always about polishing your argument until you, you finally convince people. If, if your argument is difficult to get across, then maybe it needs to be changed. And so that's the last thing. You have to be ready to adapt your arguments so that you can uh, be convincing to the people that you have to talk to. So the the second part of making good quality policy work uh, is that we have to realize that policy work is quite different to software development and it's definitely different to the, the methods that we're used to in the free and open source software ecosystem. So one not so important topic, but just important to know it's there, is that we don't get to choose the topics or the timelines or the procedures, and we just have to accept them. And, and that's different to how we uh, write software, but uh, if we accept this, then that will make the uh, the work easier because we uh, fighting against this would be mo mostly a waste of effort. More importantly is that a lot of the documents and discussions have to be kept private. And so this is something that we're not used to at all in the free software community. We, uh, we're used to our public mailing lists and our, our uh, public repositories and, and all sorts of uh, things that, that are, are easily accessible to everyone online. Uh, however, in, in policy, you have a lot of, uh, well, hopefully you will receive documents that uh, are not circulating on the internet. And so this is something that you, know, you will receive them, but if you then make them available to the entire internet, then uh, you will never receive these documents again. So the building up trust with other people uh, requires that some of this work gets done in private. 
the the discussions as well. Uh, this is something that we uh, noticed in, for example, uh, during the drafting of GPL v3. Uh, there were four different committees, and one was corporate, and one was uh, the developers, and uh, the, the two others were somewhere in the middle, but the developers were very open. They wanted everything to be public, and the corporate people wanted nothing to be public. And there was a bit of disagreement. Some of the developers thought, well, we should, you know, it's our process. We should force the corporate people to uh, participate in, in the same open way that the developers participate. Uh, however, we have to realize that for, for people in, uh, in that, that from the corporate setting or in a legal setting, uh, if you ask them to do anything in public, they will simply go silent because they, you know, they can't take risks of having to check everything with their employer before uh, saying it or uh, saying something that might contradict uh, what their employer's policy is. And so, so a lot of the work has to be done in in private. And so this means it gets done on, you know, either video calls or private mailing lists, uh, even face to face meetings. It's just something they take has to be gotten used to, uh, and the third thing is that you uh, you often have to use software that is not what we're used to. So the the development tools that we have are uh, are the best in the world, and they they are uh, they're 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 very useful, and they're something that we've gotten very uh, familiar with. However, for a lot of the policy people, will have. A legal background or a political background or even a, a business background and if you ask them to uh, submit all their work through git or to uh, to use certain uh, file sharing software that that we might think is fantastic uh, the, the result will be that they don't participate and so sometimes we have to uh, accept using software that we we think is, is pretty bad just to uh, but the important thing is to get a large group together and get a lot of work out of these people. Uh, so sometimes these sacrifices are necessary. So on that, the the way to get the most work done is to realize that you know the work one person can do uh, is not as significant as the work that a coalition can do. So building a coalition is important and the way the main way to do this is by looking for all the people who should have an interest and contacting organization after organization after organization and asking you know, who is your person that's working on liability who is your person that's working on cybersecurity and by doing this you will either find you know the person who is working on the topic or at least you'll have made a connection and when that company or organization starts working on this in uh, you know at some point later they might remember that you're also working on this and in that way the the, uh, the connection will have been useful uh, so coordination uh, must be enabled somehow you know through a, a mailing list a forum a weekly call uh, a lunch you know whatever uh, whatever works or you know all of the above if possible and it's also in uh, useful to have a structure that is somewhat visible and you know the discussions may not be visible but if people are aware of the existence of the group this can be very important because if we have for example last year well two years ago there were three full-time people doing uh, free and open source policy in brussels uh, now we have seven Possibly one of the reasons is because the work on the Cyber Resilience Act, for example, got a lot of attention and it was well organized work. And so any organization that was thinking about uh, whether to put resources onto policy, they could see that there is a structure that somebody could work within and they could see that there is work that can be done. And so this kind of visibility, it also encourages organizations to get involved. And then the structures that are, are made for working on the legislation can also be useful then once the legislation is in place to all also work on the compliance end. The, the timing is also very important in organizing. When you're building a coalition, I always say that it's important to work with as many people as possible. And you know, sometimes we have difficult people in our communities and usually I, I would say it's worth making the effort to uh, include people even ones that are difficult to work with just because we you know we need people and different points of view are also useful 
the the most difficult people to work with, however, are the people who turn up a week before the vote and say, I've got a few days free, tell me what to do. It's very difficult to onboard somebody in the final days of when, when something has just been mentioned on Slashdot or, or Wired or, or some other news outlet and, and then people start turning up. I, I think it's maybe comparable to software development in that sense. If you know, if if I wanted a new feature in my favorite piece of software in Firefox, for example, and I turn up to the Mozilla developers a week before release and say, "Hey, I've I've taken a week off work. You know, what do you want me to do?" It, it's not uh, it's not so easy for them to actually make use of that 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 offer. So, I would say turn up early, as early as possible. Uh, stay involved during the work, but also stay involved after. We we often have a lot of people who will take time off work or they'll, they'll make a certain piece of legislation their priority for you know a few months or a year but then afterwards they have to get back to their their normal job and it's unfortunate because all the experience that they built up during that year is quite rare experience and so it, it, it would be very important it would be very beneficial if we could keep that uh, somehow so try and stay involved and try and keep in contact with the people you do work with when you work on policy uh, and then there's also the, the slow work of over time building connections so that you become a contact point. Uh, I think this has been said, you know, one of the problems with free software is it doesn't have a phone number. And so you know, we're not going to solve that problem. That, that you know, It's, a, it's a, a fundamental, well, I don't even know if it's a problem, but it's a fundamental uh, issue of the free software and open source community that there is no central organization. Uh, but at least if you have been in contact with policymakers repeatedly, then when they have a question, they'll uh, possibly phone you. But maybe most important is all the work we do on policy files, on each individual policy file, it should all be considered as part of a meta project of strengthening the policy work of the free and open source uh, software ecosystem uh, in general, because this is something that we, you know, we worked on it for many years on, on copyright and patent issues. You know, it's now liability, cybersecurity and AI, but this isn't going to be the end of it. There will be other things to work on in the future. And if we start from zero each time, it makes it just all the more difficult. The last thing I'd want to mention is some suggestions for strategy. And for this, I have a, a, a not very amazing graph, but the numbers are actually impressive. So the, the European Union's Cybersecurity Agency uh, published a study and they said that 75, sorry, 70 percent of software components uh, in an average software package are free and open source software. And that was 2019 and it was increasing, so it's probably higher since then. So this gives an idea of what we should probably aim for in terms of getting the policymakers to understand. If we could get them to re realize that most software nowadays is free and open source software. So in the Cyber Resilience Act, we had a, a, a very long document and a single paragraph at the top for if you happen to release your software as free and open source software. And really that should be reversed. It should be a, the laws about software should assume that software is free and open source software. And then they should have a few paragraphs uh, included somewhere if you really insist on keeping your source code secret, uh, then a few extra conditions. And the other thing, another thing is that we should explore trying to present FOSS as a, a standardized framework. And this is because a lot of uh, IT uh, companies, a lot of IT issues are popping up and their transparency and autonomy, and we already solved these and we've been working on our framework for 40 years. So I think this is something that uh, they could understand if we present it as a standard. We also need to show that we're not about the software industry. Every industry is today uh, a software-based industry. We can learn from other countries and the more overlap we can get between the requirements of other countries, the less additional regulation we'll have for software and free and open source software in particular. I think I've run out of time for questions and answers. However, I will be available and I'm always happy to talk about this and any of the individual subtopics within that. Thank you very much.